Good morning. I want to welcome everybody to worship here at First Presbyterian Church in Taylorville. I'm wondering if anybody has any announcements for this morning. We do want to remind everybody that we're standing now for singing of the hymns and during the doxology. So now let us prepare to worship God today. Almighty God, through your only Son, you overcame death and opened to us the gate of everlasting life. Grant that we who celebrate our Lord's resurrection may through the renewing power of your Spirit arise from the death of sin to the life of righteousness. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please join me in the responsive call to worship. I will extol you, O God, for you have drawn me up and did not let me, my foes rejoice over men. O God, my God, I cried to you for help, and you have healed me. O God, you brought up my soul from Sheol. Restore me to life. To you, O God, I cried, and to you I made supplication. You have turned my mourning into dancing. You have taken off my sackcloth and clothed me with joy, so that my soul may praise you and not be silent. O oh God, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Amen. Our gathering hymn this morning is Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, number one, verses one, three, and four. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In humility and faith, let us confess our sin to God. Lord, forgive us when we so easily turn our backs on you, when we choose not to help in times of need when we utter words of anger and bitterness as ways to relate to one another. Heal our hurts and our wounded spirits. Let it lift us from the depths of our anguish 
into the light of your love that we may serve you faithfully. When the darkness becomes oppressive and we cling to our fears, Lord, forgive us. Open our hearts and release us from all those things which block us from your love. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. God's brilliant love burst through the oppressive darkness to heal our spirits and to prepare us to become effective disciples. Rejoice, God's love is poured out for you. God sent his son, they called him Jesus, he came to love, heal and forgive, he lived and died. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds a And life is worth the living just because he lives. How sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the love and joy he gives. But greater still, the calm assurance this child can face uncertain days because he lives, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone, because I know he holds a future, and life is worth the living just because he I'll cross that river, I'll fight life's high, no war with pain, and then as death gives way to
Well, good morning, everyone. I realize I left my Bible down there. Time out. Well, that's better. So how's everyone this morning? Everyone, uh, anyone actually row or jet ski or anything like that here this morning? Not this group. All right. That's okay. Um, anyway, it's great to be back here to share in the word of the Lord. Uh, it's our first Sunday after Easter Sunday, so hopefully things have gone well over the past uh, uh, month or so. So let's, um, well, let's pray. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. All right, our first scripture reading comes from the book of Acts, verses 1, or I'm sorry, chapter 9, verses 1 through 6. Hear now the word of the Lord. But Saul, still breathing, threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard the voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city. And you will be told what to do. And the men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground. And although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So that they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And then for three days he was without sight. Neither, eat, eat, um, neither ate nor drank. Excuse me. All right, I will uh, read through Revelation in a little bit. So, so the uh, Midmer Lash organ is the largest pipe organ in the world. It's located at Boardwalk Hall in uh, Atlantic City, New Jersey, and it's extremely extensively damaged in the mid-2000s when they were re uh, renovating the Boardwalk Hall. However, since that time, volunteers from around the world have come to try and bring the instrument back to life. Now, the organ consists of 33,000 pipes, well over 500 stops, a keyboard of seven ranks, it's a marvelous piece of machinery and played only at special events. The Boardwalk Hall, of course, at least at one time, hosted the Miss America pageant, presidential campaigns, and so on and so forth. There's a recording out there, if you ever have a chance to listen on to YouTube, of the famous hymn, uh, hymn Abide With Me. It starts very quiet, soft, and with each verse, it becomes louder and more full and fuller and more boisterous till at the end of the piece, you hear the entire instrument come out. An amazing sound. But everything has to work together in order for the sound to work. Sort of like an orchestra. All the instruments have to work together 
in order to have the desired peace that they are playing. The end result is usually wonderful, but of course, if you have that one violin who is out of tune, everyone knows it. When things work in sync for common good, it usually works a little bit more efficiently, a lot more efficiently for that matter. The problem is that we as people get in the way of working together for the common goal. They have a tendency of pulling things apart. Church as a whole, church universal as a whole, has been dealing with that for years and years and years. And it's not just a church thing, the societal issue. Everyone seems to have differing opinions on how things should be ran, on how theology works, on social issues, how we get people to come through the doors, etc., etc. There's so many factions of churches in every single town that someone could go church shopping every single Sunday. I know when I was uh, pastoring a church in uh, Iowa, it was a town of 900, and we still had six churches in the community. A UCC church, a Methodist church, a Presbyterian church, Catholic church, Baptist church, I think a Lutheran church too. I think that's six. Anyway. So all these churches in this town, why do we need all these? Aren't we part of the universal church? Aren't we part of the one same church? The goal of Jesus Christ to spread the word of the Lord? They're all different, of course. All interpret uh, scripture differently. But why is that the case? Several years ago, when I was still in uh, parish ministry, we had a new members class. And I had the new members watch a video from Theo Academy, uh, which is a program that the uh, uh, Presbyterian Church has put out. Um, and one of the clips I remember distinctly, uh, one of the pastors, Pastor Cho, said that we are all called to serve one another together. We individually do not make up the body of Jesus Christ. But together we bring forth the light of Jesus Christ. And yet with so many individual churches, how can we bring people together? So what does Revelation 5 have to do with this? And I'll pause there and read through the scripture. Then I looked... And I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of the many angels numbering myriads and myriads and thousands and thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing I heard every creature in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessings and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. John here uses a lot of great imagery to describe Jesus, Jesus to the best of his ability. Revelation is one of God's word. Who is able to open the word of God? And an elder responds, saying that the Lion of Judah can open the scrolls. But then John saw a slain lamb. Now, if you ever look at a picture specifically of this verse, there's lots and lots of paintings and such of Revelation. But if you look at one of the specific verse, you will note that you will see a lion with a cross on his forehead. You will note that there is a slain lamb in the middle of the painting with blood. 
You will see all the people around this slain lamb, focusing their point on this lamb. The lamb shows Jesus' sacrifice upon the cross for our sake. In John 1, it says that in the beginning was the word of God, and the word was with God, and the word became flesh. Jesus was able to be revealed in the scrolls. The word of God to the people of Israel. It's what the Gospels say. It's what the Pauline letters say. And Revelation just puts this into the local context. So I read through today's uh, focus text where everyone, angels, elders, are bowing down and singing about this lamb. Here's another possible way of putting the picture together. Think of the lamb again in the center. Think of everyone singing once again. We have to remember that in those times, lambs were something that were used as a sacrifice. Lambs were used as something to worship. And animals such as this were not likely to be the Lord our God. Remember that it's a metaphor to help us understand the power and the gentleness of Jesus himself. John's goal here seems to help us to understand that all the world revolves around this one individual, Jesus himself, who sacrificed himself for us. So in Revelation, in the scene, also depicts something even more practical. The allegiance of the Roman Empire, believe it or not. The theologian writes, the slaughtered lamb is given worship and more divine attributes are according to the lamb, name, namely wealth, wisdom, might, and blessing. These are deeply um, paradoxical to human perspective, yet John invites the reader to envision a new form of wealth in contrast to the wealthy empire. The wealth of the empire is no more, and the wealth of the kingdom of God, the one of service, not exploitation. John was going against the tide of the Roman Empire. And he was trying to convince the people to worship something that does not have wealth, but only joy. In our human nature, we tend to think of things here, now, and have difficulty in the long term and the consequences of our actions. That something we do here may have an effect, believe it or not, a hundred years from now. So when it comes to the universal church's interpretation of Christ, it tends to get lost in translation. According to sources out there, there are close to 3,000 different translations of the Bible. I'm sure here in church we have many different translations. You could probably find them throughout the whole building. There are some denominations and some churches that understand the Bible to be completely factual, without error. There's the other side, that the Bible is the inspired word of God in which the events, everything that happened, were written down and according to their understanding of what happened. See, the words of the page, though, do not come alive until they are read or interpreted. In seminary, one of my professors and a peer were debating whether to throw the entire Bible away when it is no longer useful. My professor had been using this Bible for years and years and years and was only being held on by it like a tiny thread. You can buy a new one. Buy a new one. And yet this peer thought that this Bible could not be thrown away because it would be throwing away the word of God. 
The professor argued, yes, that throwing it out because the words in the page are not living. The spirit does not live within the book itself, but inspires us and teaches us through the words that are in the book. I thought it was an interesting debate. Different interpretations of scripture, different interpretations of how we view our faith. Leads us to the whole of different interpretations of denominations, of church communities, all feeling like they have the ultimate answer to God, that my way of understanding God is the right way. But the truth of the matter is, none of us probably have it right. Lutherans probably don't have it right. Baptists don't have it right. Presbyterians don't have it right. Anabaptists, Catholic, Methodists, and so on and so forth. That when we get to the you know, white pearly gates, that's when we will be set straight of what reality truly is. The problem is that division between churches is a warning and an imagery of what John gives us here in Revelation. Do you follow the earthly church or Jesus Christ? It's only when we are truly willing to be united in Jesus Christ that we too can share in the worship experience that is depicted in the painting and in the words of Revelation. But we do our best. We do our best to understand. We do our best to worship God in a way that we know how to do. We understand that we are connected to God through Jesus Christ. We understand that we need to be the body of Jesus Christ and that our human nature can sometimes get in the way. Even the simple act of worshiping together can be difficult between two people. One person has an idea of worship, another person has an idea of worship, and the two shall never meet. There's a picture going around on Facebook. Actually, it was going around on Facebook a little while ago. And in this pic picture, the community church has eight different services. That does not promote the body of Jesus Christ. It promotes separation. Remember, worship is not something for you. It's for God. In seminary, there was a group of students who would not come to chapel unless it was a certain, or the service was a certain way, because they felt like it wasn't worship. If it didn't include guitar, drums, long prayers, it was not worship. What is worshiping God? Worshiping God is how we can understand God. How we grow in God. Does it matter how we worship God just as long as we are worshiping God? If you notice, my title is called The Church Wars. Because church is going against each other for the common good of Jesus Christ. Because if they don't, Revelation will become a reality much faster than we can imagine. John writes, Then I looked and heard the voice of the many angels, numbering in the thousands upon thousands, and ten times thousands. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. And then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all of them picture that, uh, that John is putting out of worship and praise is what it's all about. It's all about God. It's not about us. No matter who we are, no matter who we proclaim to be, no matter what denomination we are, we must be speaking of the word of God to be the people of God. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
All right, will you join us in our uh, sermon hymn number 250 in your hymnal? Please stand if you're able. have any uh, joys or concerns we would like to lift up this morning? Yeah. Uh, Joe did break the bone in his foot last week. He was walking around five row on his Good. Anyone else? Right, let us pray then. Our most gracious and loving God, as we're in the first Sunday past the Lord's resurrection, may we use this opportunity to Reflect upon just what you did for our sake. That what you did, Lord, was not an act of separation, but an act of coming together. An act of joy, ultimately. An act of peace. an act to promote something that is of God. We know, Lord, that many times it can be hard for us to come together to agree just on what you have to teach us, what you have to preach, how we interpret your life and your death and your resurrection and how we can best proclaim it 
in this world. Sometimes, Lord, we're even lost. Truly what we need to do in this world. Lord God, with your guidance, with our open hearts and our open ears and our open senses that we can we can follow in your footsteps, we can do the work of your uh, Son, Jesus Christ, in this world to the best of our abilities. We know, Lord, that we can. We have the capability of doing so. It's just helping us to remind us why we are here, why we serve you. Lord God, let us lift up in prayer those who are heavy on our hearts and our minds. We lift up the uh, royal family in their time of grief and loss. Um, I'd like to lift up in healing and celebration, both at the same time, uh, of wellness, breaking bones and such. And things will be healed. And once again, back to whatever normal is. Well, God, we'd like to pray for the community of Taylorville here. We'd like to pray for the state of Illinois, for our country, for our world, and the people and the creatures and the creation that inhabit this place. May we honor them and grow with them. In Jesus Christ we pray. Let us lift up in prayer the prayer the Lord taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So give because you are thankful. Be generous because you can. Jesus commanded us to love one another. Show that through your offerings, if you haven't mailed a check or mailed in your gift or given online, there are certainly offering plates available by the back door as you leave this morning. Please stand if you're You can be generous on every occasion, and through your generosity will result in thanksgiving to the Lord our God. Amen. Now will you please stand if you're able for our closing hymn, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee, number 611.
love in this world. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.